Liberty, justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you, everyone. And now roll call, please. Ken Nelson. Here. <clears throat> Linda DeGray. Here. Mary Scott. Virginia Higley. Francis Alimo. Here. John Petronella. Here. Vinny Grillo. Here. And Richard Suzak is here. Okay, at this time, I'd like to see uh, both alternate members, uh, John Petronella and Vinny Grillo for the remainder of the meeting. Okay, um, moving on. Can I get approval of minutes of January 14th, 2021's regular meeting? So moved. Second. Motion's made and seconded by Commissioner Suzak. Any questions, comments, concerns, or corrections? No. Seeing none, uh, all in favor by a show of hands. All in favor, none against. Um, public participation. Is there anyone out there who would like to speak uh, in regards to any issues that is currently not on our agenda? If so, please speak up. Anyone? Okay, seeing none. Do we have any bond releases this evening? Uh, nope, no bond releases. No bond releases. Okay, I see TV is on, so we should be good. Moving on, continued public hearings. Public hearing 2988.2, 135 Freshwater Boulevard. Roll call, please. <clears throat> Ken Nelson. Here. Linda DeGray. Here. Virginia Higley, I don't see her. Here. Um, I'm oh, there. Oh, she's here. Good. Oh, she is there. Okay. Me forever, but I'm here. Okay. Frank Alimo. He's here. Don Petronella. Here, sorry. Vinny Grillo. <coughs> and Richard Suzak is here. Uh, anybody for the applicant here? If so, state your name and address for the record. Uh, yes, good evening, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, Dave Zayax from F.A. Heskett Associates. Uh, and uh, with me um, is uh, Sean DeBella and others uh, representing the applicants. Um, the last meeting, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at uh, an idea about uh, constructing a new berm along Freshwater Boulevard and landscaping that. And then we got into some discussions about some other ideas, some other concerns the commission had. And uh, all parties agreed at that time to uh, continue the hearing to tonight to give us a chance to uh, try to address some of the comments from the commission and, uh, and also give the commission members some time to reflect on all the information that's been given you regarding this application. Uh, there was a couple of things in particular that uh, the uh, commission asked for. One was for us to uh, get an accurate measurement on the height of the existing building, the layered plastics building. And we did that, we went out and we measured that at the rear of the building, closest to the woods. Um, the uh, elevation of the building is uh, 143. And um, our highest ground point, um, you know, within our open space area, or outdoor storage area is 124. So uh, it's 19 feet high from um, the outdoor storage area. And uh, we also, somebody made some, I think made a suggestion for us to uh, place some balloons out in, in the area where the containers would be located. And the applicant did that. I'm not sure if any of the commission members had a chance to look at it, but we have some photos that we'll show you in a minute here. Uh, so that you get an idea of, uh, you know, the relative distance of the um, container units to Freshwater Boulevard. Uh, what I brought along with me this evening is uh, I have some PowerPoint. Uh, since this is the easiest way to illustrate this stuff to you folks. Um, is the uh, share button on? Yep, there it is. There we go. So let's see, where am I here? Can everyone see that now? 
Yeah. Yes. Um, again, just, you know, I, I think everybody's familiar with uh, what we're looking at with the existing site and the proposed building. Yep. And uh, so what we did was uh, a suggestion of uh, commission was uh, to look at the, uh, the possibility of uh, constructing a berm and some additional landscaping along the southerly boundary line. Uh, one of the concerns raised was being able to look through the uh, wooded area uh, to the south of the parcel and to the west of the parcel as you're walking or driving along Freshwater Boulevard, in particular heading north on Freshwater Boulevard. And um, so uh, we were successful at uh, coming up with a design for that. I submitted those plans to uh, staff this week. Um, basically, what we would do is construct a uh, four to five foot high berm down in this location here, and then install a um, whole row of arborvitae, tall arborvitae, in the, starting out in the 10 to 12 foot height. Uh, is those, those are available. We've checked with some local nurseries, and they'll be available this spring. Uh, so that would give us uh, you know, an initial planting height of somewhere around uh, 16 feet or so through this, this entire area here to provide some additional screening uh, during the uh, wintertime months. Uh, that arborvitae species that our landscape architect picked out, that will grow up to a height of uh, 25, 25 feet. Five, 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 five. Oops, we got some feedback there. Um, on top of that berm. So, um, and those arborvitaes grow pretty quickly from what I understand. So uh, that's the proposal, the berm in the front here along Freshwater Boulevard uh, that we talked about last time that would stay the same. I think one of the suggestions was to put irrigation on it to, to make sure it stays nice and healthy. Uh, and uh, that was uh, brought up as a you know, possible conditions of an approval. So the berm in the front, as we talked about last time would stay the same. Uh, we would add this berm along the southerly boundary line and wrap it around the corner to close the gap and then plant it heavily with uh, arborvitae. And uh, this was just the uh, layout plan to show that we had pulled the, and previously we had done this, but we would pull the, uh, the area where the outdoor storage would take place, uh, you know, within the side yard um, for the zone. And in that side yard is where the berm would be constructed and the additional plantings would be, uh, would be placed. Um, then uh, doing some more homework, the, uh, the applicant spent a lot of time uh, out on the site, taking some additional photos and everything to try to uh, illustrate to the commission, uh, you know, the situation that's out there. And then they had their architect prepare kind of an interesting three-dimensional model for us, give us a little better idea. These models are actually pretty cool the way they can do this today. Um, but let me call that one up. This is just some information for the commission. I think there were some other questions from some of the commission members. A little, a little quick uh, measuring tool here. Uh, looking down the south side of the existing building, sort of square with uh, Freshwater Boulevard, it's about 343 feet to where the first units would be located. Then looking down, you know, moving down Freshwater Boulevard a little bit to the south, uh, to that the nearest point on Excuse the other me, side Dave, of the berm. Dave, I don't uh, think we're seeing the, uh, the uh, things are not coming up yet that I can see. Oh yeah, okay, let me see. Let me make sure it's sharing the right way here for us. Let's see, what do I got to click here? Oh, there we go, resume share, there we are. Got a, I got a lot of buttons open here all of a sudden. Here. How's that look, do you see that now? No, uh, no, we still see just the uh, the regular um, master plan, it looks like. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Now there we are, okay. Thank you. There's about 12 buttons that you could guess wrong here, I'm sorry about that. Uh, starting over again, this was the, uh, the idea was that somebody had brought up some, well, what are the real distances? And again, just using a nice little scaling tool here, uh, looking down the south side of the building, again, we're at about 343 so feet 
uh, to where the first units would be from uh, Freshwater Boulevard. Just another look a little further down to the south because everything's skewed a little bit. Uh, you'd be about 254 plus feet to that corner, that southwest corner where the units would be. Uh, again, just a couple of other things. I may have shown these before, I'm not sure, but this is basically how heavily wooded it is in the summertime. Here's some photos uh, from the summertime. So we can see, I think it's pretty clear that in the summertime, uh, or when the trees are in bloom, starting from the spring really to the fall, but call it the summertime. Uh, I don't think there's any, any concern at all about being able to see these uh, units from Freshwater Boulevard. And then in the gap in the front where our new berm would go, I think that would really close it off. So again, focusing back on to the wintertime conditions, present conditions, here's some photos taken just literally a couple of days ago. And this is the existing building. And then we're marching down to the south here along Freshwater. Uh, you can see uh, the vegetation that's out there now. And I think it's important to note that, you know, here's the existing building and, and really the units uh, that would be stacked in the back there, uh, just by coincidence, they're, they're, they're like the same color as the building is, just to give you a reference. They're right around the same color, that sort of tannish color. Um, you know, uh, all of them are painted the same color, so there's no, there's no uh, variation. But as you can see, as you start to move a little further south, you really lose the view of the building uh, from Freshwater Boulevard. And that would be, you know, sort of driving up from the north uh, you know, northbound on freshwater. And again, just to see the, you know, the density of the trees. Here, uh, th this is where it gets tricky because uh, what the applicant did, they produced these uh, photos, but you could just barely see the balloons uh, through the photos where these circles are. Here you can see the, there's a balloon hanging there. They're up about the 24, 25 feet from the ground. So, you know, if you stare through the woods long enough, you can hear they put in a couple of blue ones just to try to offer a different color than the tan because the tan kind of gets um, camouflaged, you know, with all the leaves on the ground and things like that right now. So they put up a couple of small uh, blue ones out there just to give they're you actually three, three foot diameter too. those balloons were quite large. Yeah. Yeah. So they're three foot diameter. And here, here's a, uh, I think here's an interesting um, architectural rendering that uh, that was done in using uh, you know today's uh, 3D technology. But um, in looking at this, you can see what they did was, here's our new arborvitae row here, and then the existing trees. Uh, they stacked up the, uh, the mobile mini units three high along that uh, corner of the uh, site. And um, I think I think really, I didn't even think of this before, but uh, thinking about it some more is, I think you're gonna see that from the distance we're talking about, you know, 250 to 300 feet away, if you stack the units this way, from that distance, they start to look like the building. Uh, they don't look like a bunch of stacked units. I, I think that's what will happen. But if I show you the actual video here, this, uh, this gets a little interesting. This is a rendering that was done. So you can see, here's the units down, stacked along the end here. Here's the existing building, and then it rotates down to, you know, giving an approximate looking at the street. And so you can see, you can sort of see the existing building, and if you stare at it long enough, you might be able to see the very tops of those units. But, you know, I'm not convinced you're going to be able to see anything, to be perfectly honest with you. But again, just looking at this again, it's kind of cool technology. Make it interesting for everybody tonight. But uh, here, this would be our new arbor variety row, and then rotating down to, to grade level, so a car or somebody walking along Freshwater Boulevard. So, uh, you know, in, in summary, Mr. Chairman and the members, uh, you know, the applicants has done, uh, I think, the best they can in, in trying to illustrate the point. Um, they've <laughs> added two berms, uh, lots of landscaping. Certainly, summertime is not an issue. It's only during the winter time that you know that could raise the question, and I think it's I think it's it, it, I think it's a it's a fair statement to make that, uh, particularly for people traveling driving in their car down the road. I just don't see where this is going to be an issue to see these units through this wooded area, uh, particularly with the additional landscaping. Um, Sean, did you have any other comments to make? I, I yeah, just have one, board, one oh, thing ahead, for sir. you, Dave. Can you the the three D that you showed was pretty incredible. 
Can you, do you have anything at the front of the building that would show how the containers would be over the roof line or if they're over the roof line? You know, we don't have it in this, in this uh, uh, type of technology. Um, uh, other than, the, you know, we had the, the, the elementary, you know, two uh, dimensional, three dimensional uh, cross sections that we showed you uh, last time, but Unfortunately, we don't have the this this uh, lined up uh, with this type of technology. So um, you don't have one, a different one from the front of the building. No, 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 we don't okay. have that. No, yep. That's all. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. Sorry, sure. sorry. No, that's Sean. okay. Absolutely. Go ahead, Sean. So uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, just to add to that point before um, I just you know just kind of close things out is uh I, I that berm we did want to get one done, but unfortunately because of time constraints, these things don't happen very quickly um and it takes a lot of a lot of work to go into it, make sure it's accurate and so on and so forth but the berm in the front the um, architect said you know even if he was attempt to do that it's just going to be looking at because of the elevations it's just going to be looking at a berm like a landscape you're not going to be able to see through the landscape you won't be able to see anything in the back so effectively that berm out front and then the there's a berm in the rear also um, a build up in between the two buildings that would effectively block every single view it would be a very closed off lot at that point so um just to fill you in on that because I, I had spoken with the architect and asked for that vantage point but there just wasn't the time to create it and it, he didn't think it would be um you know too relevant it would just be a big burn um but anyway so i did prepare just a just a, a quick um a couple notes i jotted down and I, and I did jot them down so um i hope that uh nobody's bothered by my reading <laughs> but um i didn't want to miss anything so uh, here it goes um, as the applicants and developers, we felt that it was important to seize this opportunity to speak directly to the commission in hopes of keeping this project in Enfield. While the project was approved, Mobile Mini has informed us that the restriction of stacking containers too high will not allow them to operate out of this location. Uh, we want to let the board know that we have heard the concerns of each commissioner. We greatly appreciate your valuable feedback. Uh, we've invested a substantial amount of time and resources to come up with the answer to everyone's question. As Mr. Zayax mentioned, we believe the newly proposed changes enable us to offer a better product that will successfully address questions about passersby seeing containers on the occasions that they need to be stacked three high. Considering the measures we have taken to effectively screen this development, along with the existing site line obstruction offered by the surrounding landscapings, as well as the fact that the proposed uh, development is in the rear portion of the lot in an industrial zone, we hope that you will seriously consider allowing the restriction of a third container to be lifted. I know that Mobile Mini is eager to be a part of this community, and we hope we can bring them here. And uh, we just appreciate your time and, and all the effort everybody put into this. And, um, you know, just uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Well, Mr. Chairman, we'll be happy to answer any additional questions you might have at this time. Okay, sounds good. Commissioners, can you exit from the screen, Dave? Yes, I can. So I can see. There you go. There we go. Commissioners, uh, Rich. Yeah, and again, you know, I, I would have to commend the applicant as to, to his due diligence to try to, you know, I guess justify his requ his requirements. But, you know, I think that what we need to do is we need to look at our regulations. And it, again, our regulations do say that outdoor storage should not exceed, you know, 20% of the, you know, area in, in, at the, the side and rear yard of the building. They also say that, you know, this, all, all outdoor storage must be screened. It doesn't say, you know, it must be screened in 20 years or must be screened in five years. It just says must be screened now. Um, and, you know, yeah, I, I, I keep, we, we, you know, like you said, it would be nice to, to vary our regulations to and modify our regulations for every applicant because of the fact that they can't conform with our regulations. But ultimately, you know, we would be just be, you know, totally destroying, you know, the requirements and, you know, what our regulations are supposed to, to do and stay state so that we can be consistent in, in our reviews of proposed buildings and properties. And, you know, as, as like you said, as much as I, I would commend that they did do a good job and, and you know, they, it would be nice to have them in, in our community. We, we just cannot vary our opinions or, you know, again, you know, just disregard our regulations so that we can, you know, accommodate every business that, that can't conform to our regulations. Because then all of a sudden we just have chaos. So, 
you know, with that said, you know, I would like to support this, but I can't because our regulations don't allow us to support it. So, you know, I, I think that they did a good job. They presented it well, but ultimately, you know, it, it's, it's not in conformance with our regulations and they, they haven't really proved that they're really going to be screening everything that we're going to be seeing. I think that, you know, at, at a two height stacking, I think that, you know, they would more or less conform with our regulations, but, you know, for screening. But at, at three high, you know, I think I, it would be difficult for me to support it, so. Thank you, Rich. Commissioner Higley. Um, all the paperwork I read on this, it stated that layered plastics was gonna be responsible for maintaining 25% of the berm. I haven't seen anything that says layered plastics has agreed to that. And we all want the berm to be healthy and well taken care of. So I have a problem with that. Thank you. John? Uh, yeah, so I, I can speak to that. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, obviously we wouldn't move ahead with any of this. We're very responsible um, builders and we, we would have not moved ahead if, if uh, Laird Plastics wasn't fully on board. We have a great relationship with them. We actually just uh, bought the property recently. They're so excited to have us as owners. We've done um, oh, okay. maintenance to the building. We put a new roof on, we put new doors, all at their request because that's just the type of people that we are. Those are Every building okay. that you would see that we have is beautiful. And we're, we're not um, there to go to, 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 to the town and to bring an eyesore to the town. That's absolutely not what we so, want. We would definitely maintain, the, you know, if we needed to do the irrigation, which we want to keep the berm healthy, then, you know, 100%. Okay. We just want to be a good partner okay. with the town as well. So then you'll be 100% uh, responsible um, for it because you own right. the property. 100%, exactly. Okay. Okay, thank you. You have my, you have my word on that. Uh -huh. Commissioner Petronella. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I certainly, uh, like Rich, I, I echo that, uh, that the applicant has done a good job in, in trying to address the height thing. And, and I know that you know, things got, you know, uh, uh, focused on, on the height specifically. Uh, but as, as Rich also touched on, you know, section 6.30.2, uh, puts a restriction on rear outdoor storage space for, uh, for the parcels. And, and the applicant hasn't really shown if, if he's going to be uh, in compliance with that 20%. Uh, he's shown the whole area to be gravel and for, uh, uh, to be used as storage. It also goes further to say under uh, 6.30.2, B4, uh, outdoor storage must be defined areas and, and not scattered about throughout the site. And, and, and again, on the plan, nothing is specifically defined as to where the storage is going to be. Um, you know, and again, just inferring from the plans, it's just uh, the entire area is graveled. So one would assume he's using the entire area for, uh, for storage. So, uh, I know that this regulation came about in 2017 and, and got some, uh, um, uh, um, was, was uh, um, uh, um, part of a, uh, uh, um, you know, pretty uh, a comprehensive uh, 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 review to come up with, to come up with uh, this, this type of regulation and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I, I'm just having, uh, a difficult time supporting that, not sh not showing the uh, the storage. Um, uh, the height thing, um, you know, again, I think the applicant did a good job in addressing it, uh, but uh, moreover, I, I think the storage area uh, not being defined and, and not knowing if he's going to uh, meet the 20% requirement, uh, I, I just have a hard time uh, supporting it uh, based on that. All set, John? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Alimo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you to the applicants, uh, all the work you did uh, over the last couple of weeks. Appreciate uh, all the effort. Um, so relative to some of the other discussion we just had um, in the uh, last two commissioners, I think that we've already approved this. I hope I'm correct here. And we're looking at the, the berm and um, height. They're here really for 
one of the conditions of approval to uh, let them go three higher, to up to three. And the issue was seeing it and protecting it from the vision of the public. So I, I'm only focusing on that. So it was already approved. So I, I'm focusing on what they're here for. So I think over the last two weeks, they did a tremendous amount of work. And I think they've shown that it's going to be uh, protected from the eye. I think uh, from, you know, all year round, they showed uh, visuals of the current situation. So for what's before us, I can support it because it already, like I said, as far as coverage, um, we already approved this and they're, they're here just for this one item, which was uh, for us to relax one of the conditions of approval relative to how high they can stack the containers. And our discussion at our last meeting was about it being an eyesore and being visible going uh, south, coming up from the south, going north and from the front. So I believe the applicant has satisfied our questions and our concerns relative to that. So um, again, I, I'm only looking at what we're what we have before us tonight, and I can support um, I can support what we have before us tonight because again, I think they they went above and beyond to uh, listen to our concerns as far as uh, relative to screening um, that third container. And again, I'm just looking at the third container, not the first two containers or anything else that's been brought up tonight because this application was already approved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Alimo. Commissioner Higley, did you wanna speak again? I see your hand still up. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I forgot to take it down. That's quite okay. Um, any other commissioners? Um, I agree with Commissioner Alimo. Uh, we are basically just looking at the third container. They have done everything this commission has asked including the arborvitaes, which are year round greenery. And um, as far as uh, storage, the word keeps getting used. I consider it inventory, uh, no different than a car dealership um, or the body shop that the commission approved right down the road from this that has outside inventory sitting in the parking lot waiting to be brought in the building. Cars are waiting to be sold. Um, so I don't written, really call it storage. Um, and I look at a company like this, they're not making money if the yard's full of containers. So I do agree that they met um, the requirements to satisfy me. Um, you look at those balloons, they don't look like they're three feet. They look like they're little party balloons and that's how far back we're talking about. So um, I agree with Commissioner Alimo on this. Anybody else before I open it to the public? Okay, seeing none. Is there anybody out there who would like to speak in favor or against public hearing 2988.2135 Freshwater Boulevard? If so, state your name and address for the record. Going for the second time, public hearing 2988.2. And going for the third time. Okay, seeing none, how would the commission like to proceed? To vote. Uh, do you want to vote to close the public hearing? Yes. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So move. I move to seconded. Motions made by Commissioner DeGray, seconded by Commissioner Higley. Roll call, please. This Ken is Nelson. to close the public hearing. Four. Ken Nelson. DeGray. Four. Um, Virginia Higley. Four. Frank Limo. Four. John Petronella. Four. Vinny Grillo. Four. And Richard Segal. Four. Okay, all in favor. How would let, how would the commission like to proceed? Well, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve um, the proposed modification to public hearing twenty nine eighty eight. Um, point two, um, with the draft re resolutions prepared by staff dated, uh, I guess it's dated the January, 
14th with the modifications to the drawings that we received today to today. So with, with that modification. Um, uh, uh, sorry to um, interrupt, um, but did you want to add a condition that it, it be limited to three, a uh, stacked three tall, the containers? Because the original the original condition was two containers, um, and I didn't put a condition in there, um, just in, uh, so that the commission could decide on what the condition might be if they wanted one. Not to exceed three containers. Is commission good with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, motion's made. Is there a second? Again, I'd like to state that. I second, second. that. Motion's made and seconded. Roll call, please. You can I have a discussion? You can. Well, I, like you said, I just want to reiterate, you know, my, our, my position is that, you know, it, and again, I, I do realize that we're only, you know, voting or we're only considering the addition of a third unit onto the um, current conditions that exist because the current conditions had two two units stackable and and like you said you know I, it, it just appears to me that you know we we have leaned over backwards to approve the application the first time around and it, it appears that you know we're never going to be able to satisfy everybody all the time and that you know i think that we're fooling ourselves if, if we think that you know it's good business to modify our regulations just so that we can satisfy everybody for what they want to do and within our town because ultimately it's just going to lead down the wrong path so with that you know i'll make a the road I, I don't know if anybody else has any comments but mm -mm. Seeing none. Okay, Ken Elson. Four. Linda DeGray. Four. Virginia Higley. Against. Frank Alimo. Four. John Petronella. Against. Vin Vinnie Grillo. Four. And Rich Suzak is against. Okay, so what is that? Three, four against, if my math is correct. Four, four, and then three against. Right. Okay. Right. Does that motion pass? Does it need to be five? No. No. Simple no. majority. Majority. Simple majority. Okay. okay. The motion passes. Um, congratulations. Welcome to Enfield. Um, and Thank you. I, I wish you the best success and good luck with the business. Thank you. So Thank you. We appreciate it. No thank problem. You. Have a great night. Thank you, thank you Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I want, I want to uh, thank the commission for putting as much time and patience involved in this application. And I'm before you folks a lot. And uh, it's always a pleasure to do your job very well. Thank you. Thank you, thank Dave. You. Have a good night. Right now. Good night. Good night. OK, do we have any new public hearings this evening? I don't know. Yeah! <laughs> You're on, you're still on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do we have any new public hearings this evening? Everybody uh, no, got to no. admit that was funny. <laughs> okay, we're all laughing, so. All right, no, no new public hearing. Um, no. I don't see any old business, correct? No old business, no new business. Great. No new business. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Am I wrong, Jen? Sorry. SPR seven for seven ten. Yeah, new seven. business. Oh, oh, so, oh that yeah. is under that is under uh, new business. Sorry about that. I was just looking at site plan. Sorry. <laughs> okay. New business site plan review SPR number eighteen forty six seven ten seven eighteen Enfield Street. Roll call, please. Or do we do here? Linda DeGray. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. Frank Alimo. Here. John Petronella. Here. Vinny Grillo. Here. And Richard Suzak is here. Okay. 
Uh, is there anyone here for the applicant? If so, state your name and address for the record, please. Good evening, Daniel McKellick from Bacon Wilson, uh, part of the COVID response team at 99 Westfield Road today, Westfield, Massachusetts. Welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none. Okay, uh, tell us a little a couple bit. Others. Um, excuse me, Jay, did you wanna? Yeah, for the record, uh, Jay Ursry, J.R. Russo and Associates here representing the applicant and uh, I will be assisting the attorney in terms of walking you through the, the site and the site plan that we have here this evening to give you an overview of, of what we're looking to do. Welcome, Jay. Thank you. Bob, anyone else? Uh, Bob Corvo, I'm the broker of the transaction uh, representing uh, the sellers and the buyer. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. All right, well, tell us a little bit about what you'd like to do. Good evening, Commission. Thank you very much for your time tonight. And I'll tell you the celebration there it reminds me of the high fives in the hallways after the after the hearings. You know, we just we got a little sample of that. It was it was pretty neat. So um, we have uh, my office represents Batool Express, okay, who is looking to purchase the parcels in question. All right, we have submitted our um, application for a site plan review, and with that um, contained a copy of the deed. And it also contained permission from the landowners to uh, the current landowners to follow up. We're in a purchase and sale arrangement right now. Okay. We also included in there some uh, historical information relative to deep. This used to be a gas station. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this property. Um, and the tanks have been removed. There's no open file at deep. And um, there's a parking variance on record relative to 718 for accessory parking uh, or ancillary parking relative to 710. And um, at the end of the day, do you want me to read that? You have a narrative in there, but I'm more than happy to read that into the record if we'd like to um, or summarize it, whichever you prefer. A summary is fine. Okay. All right. So. The parcel has a history of being a uh, automotive repair uh, filling station, as we said uh, earlier, and um, a tow, a tow lot it had an impound lot in the back there. Um, there were prior applications before the ZBA relative to this parcel after the last proprietor, uh, Porcello, passed away. And at the end of the day, what they were trying to do was maintain the maximum use of the property that was permitted at that time. Uh, the current application for uh, the tool, we have a site plan that um, we have some changes to the site plan, which would actually bring it into um, you know, more conformity, I guess would be the, the, the proper choice of words. And um, as, as it's a non-conforming lot, and we're gonna do this by um, reducing the number of working bays from five to three. Okay, we're eliminating a basement apartment at 718. Okay, and we'll walk, Jay will walk you through all this on the, on the uh, plan too. And then um, remove one of the garage doors that faces the uh, carpet street entrance and then relocate another door to create a means of um, entrance into the building so we can put some parking spots in there that are striped out. Right now, there's no striping in the lot or anything like that. Neither has, there hasn't been any historically. And then to add to the south side, right across essentially, a new garage door so we can create the, the traffic can pass through the, the building when they're repairing the cars and pulling them in and out rather than driving around on the carpet in Enfield Street, um, how it used to be, okay? Just to increase some safety concerns. Um, we took a look at the zoning requirements for parking spots for the type of use. And um, according to the code, it would require 18 spots. And we've tried to deliver that to the best of our ability within the, um, the non-conforming lot that we're working with. In general, there's no, um, you know, no work's going to be done on the outside. Uh, well, we'll get into that a little further, I guess, in, in a bit. But um, 
we're going to repaint and finish a few things other than the garage doors and then i'll go through a, a short little list of uh, items that we're looking to do um, operations going to be auto repair and uh, very limited used vehicle sales um, all things that the property has a long long history going back to you know i i on information and belief the 20s as a filling station and um, confirmation from the um, Department of Transportation for um, the 50s relative to used car sales. Um, hours of operation would be Monday through Friday, 7 to 7, Saturday, 8 to 3, your standard auto repair type um, hours. This isn't a 24-hour joint or anything like that. And um, the repairs that we have in mind are to um, improve the safety of maintain the traffic within the lot. So thereby improving safety in the uh, surrounding areas, um, cutting back vegetation, bringing the building back to life. That's kind of an eyesore right now, repaving um, or patching or cracking, depending on, you know, filling in the cracks, depending on the need. Um, it is, uh, it is a very tired parking lot if you've walked it any time lately. And, um, and yeah, that's what, uh, that's what we're looking to do. So we were asked to um, come before the commission for an administrative review of the proposed site plan relative to these cosmetic and safety changes that the applicant would like to make to be sure that the changes aren't increasing the nonconformity. Um, we do have a determination from the uh, zoning enforcement officer that the use, the building, and the lot are uh, pre-existing um, non-conforming uses and structures and just non-conforming in general. And um, right now, I will turn it over to uh, Jay to walk you through the plan so you can identify with, um, eyes what I showed you or sorry, I talked you through there. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, for the record, Jay Ursary, J.R. Russo here representing the applicant. And uh, I'm gonna try and just walk you through the site and, and show you what is currently there and what we're proposing. And uh, uh, hopefully answer any questions you may have in terms of, of the changes to the site. So I'm gonna, attempt to share my screen here with you and put a plan up. And if I run into trouble, I have my uh, IT consultant here with me, my youngest son, Greg, who knows a lot more about this computer stuff than I do. So just bear with me here for a minute. Let me see if I can get a plan up on the screen for us. Okay, can everybody see this? Yes. yes. Okay, it worked. I needed minimal assistance, so we're, we're off to a good start. So <clears throat> here's the site that's the subject of the application, and I know we're all pretty familiar with it. This is Enfield Street here to the north uh, is Carpet Street. The main building or the garage building is located here. And you know what, let me see if I can blow it up a little bit to make it a little easier to see. Does that help? Does that yes. help you guys? Yeah, all right. So again, Carpet Street to the north, to the east down here, Enfield Street, and the main building, which is 710, is located here. And, and that's the, the building that Porcello has used for as Dan had said, for decades. Uh, it was a filling station back in the 20s, moving forward in time, repair service, towing, uh, used car sales, and so on and so forth. Uh, the property to the south, located here, 718, was a, a residential property, I'm, I'm assuming, when Porcellos first bought it. Uh, they used them in conjunction with each other uh, there were three apartments located in that building, I think, a few years back, and as well as some office space and used car sales. And if we go just a little bit further to the south, you'll see 
uh, entrance here off of Enfield Street and Route 5 that gets us to the parking area located here in the back. And I apologize, I'm scrolling around here. There are two curb cuts on Enfield Street that get us to the fronts of both of these buildings. Um, the larger building, the repair garage and former gas station has three overhead doors located on the front, two pass doors, and again, a curb cut here that comes in to access those. And then as we go down to Carpet Street, you see that we have another curb cut here with two overhead doors that are located on the building on the, on the north side at this location. So <clears throat> in the narrative that you have, and, and Dan briefly went over, uh, you note that in years past, there were, I guess, five repair bays or lifts located in the main building. There were three apartments located in the residential building. There was a basement apartment, a first floor apartment, and a upper story apartment, as well as some office space incorporated into that for the used car sales. So this property is, is a property that had a lot of things going on in it over the years. And it obviously wasn't large enough to accommodate all of that. In fact, when I looked at the GIS on your uh, website the other day, and I started counting cars over here to the rear and the, the south of the main building and the rear of the apartment building, there was 18 cars located just in this area right back here. The area in the front had cars parked all the way across the front. Um, I, I'm assuming used cars for sale. I really don't know, to be honest. And there were also some cars parked back here. So when we start looking at your regulations and looking at the requirements, we find that, you know, to support the use that was in the buildings for many years prior and looking at your regs, there's no way we could fit the amount of parking spaces on this site that would be required by your current regulations. So the current buyer for the property has agreed to essentially reduce or I guess reduce the intensity of the use to allow us to at least do the best we can in meeting the regulations in terms of parking. And they're doing that by reducing on the residential structure over here, the number of apartments from three to two, still has some office space. We'll still have a, a small used car office space. And then again, reducing the area in the main building from five service bays to three service bays. So it changes the parking requirements substantially. And when we look at it, and actually Jennifer did a good job in her, in her memo of going through this with you and, and taking a look at the parking requirements. But basically what it does is when we look at the multifamily dwelling with two units, we need four spaces. The biz, business professional office, one per thousand. We've got a small office space in that building requires one space. The motor vehicle sales display area requires one space. <clears throat> and the automotive use, which requires the most, three per service bay, uh, we've got three, nine spaces, and one per employee with three employees is three more for a total of 18 spaces. And on this particular plan, let me back out here just a little bit. We're showing 18 spaces and they consist of Spaces located here to the rear of, of the uh, residential building, one space here between the two buildings, and then additional spaces located here behind the main building. And then in terms of employees, we have a space that's located here within the building, another one here within the building. And then we have a space located here where uh, clients could pull their car in they can be looked at, determine what service is necessary, and then move on to, to the service bay. So we've been able, we've reduced again the intensity of the use, and we were able to accommodate the number of spaces based on your regulations that might be required. So let me uh, go to a different sheet here. So here we have some floor plans and Let's take a look first at 
the existing floor plan of both buildings is located over here. Here's the residential building. Here's the larger uh, building that Porcello's owned. And just in terms of looking at the fronts of the buildings, there aren't gonna be any changes to the fronts that are facing uh, Enfield Street or Route 5. There's a pass door on the office building here and there's another one here. Those are gonna stay the same. There's three overhead doors on the front of the building here on the main building facing Route 5. Those are gonna stay the same. There are two overhead doors here on the north side of the Porcello building and those are gonna be modified. And let me go to the, to the, what I'm gonna call proposed floor plan and let's look at that a little bit. And what we're gonna do in the back here on the Porcello building is we're gonna eliminate one of the overhead doors and then we're gonna take one and we're gonna move it to the east and we're gonna add one back here along the, the south side of the building as well as a pass door or a man door to allow cars to go back and forth through the building. And I think probably what had been happening over the years is because there was no way to get through the building and get back and forth is they would pull in the front and, and if they had to go to the back, they'd back out onto Route 5 and go down Carpet Street and pull in to the service base in the, in the rear. And, and we're trying to eliminate that situation so that we can essentially bring cars into the service bays in the back through the front door and then be able to get them out through the back and be able to come back out to Route 5 or park them waiting for a customer to come pick them up and they would be parked either over here behind the residential building or over here uh, behind the Porcello building. So we're trying to eliminate backing in and out of these bays here on a regular basis back out towards Route 5 to make it a little safer. So again, just to reiterate, there really isn't any changes proposed to the front of the building. Now, cosmetically, and, and I think Dan touched on it a little bit in terms of the the parking area, some of the bituminous area is in rough shape. Some of it's been dug up due to the removal of underground storage tanks. And that happened here in the front area and some area here in the back. Um, those areas are going to be patched and paved. There's also going to be the addition of a dumpster uh, location here to the rear. And that'll be fenced and screened as is required in your regulations. Currently, uh, I didn't see a dumpster the last time I was out there, I don't know, a week or so ago. I'm, I'm not sure what the residential folks do for trash. Maybe they just have the small push out that goes out to the street, but we're going to provide that back here to the rear and that'll be screened. There's also a fence that essentially surrounds this property on the south side and on the westerly side. And one of the things that was in that variance that Dan touched upon was the fact that this fence needed to be six feet high and that there was no parking of used cars for sale within nine feet of the fence on this side. And, and we're showing a nine foot setback here. Most of that fence is, is in pretty rough shape and it's gonna be uh, uh, replaced with a new six foot high chain link fence with privacy slats. Uh, which will be a little bit better situation from what we have there now. Although in saying that, the entire surrounding property is owned by the same budding owner. Uh, this is zone business, this is zone business. This one happens to be a residential parcel here on Carpet Street, but all the fence will be replaced with a new fence with privacy slats, which I think will make the condition a little better than what it is today. And as Dan had mentioned, we will certainly be painting the buildings and sprucing up uh, the fronts and sides and so forth, because they haven't been used in a while and, and they've really come into disrepair. So we've done the what we feel is, is necessary to at least be able to provide the required parking based on the intensity of the use within the buildings, which certainly wasn't there in years, years past. And, and we're hopeful that uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission yourselves, as well as the Zoning Board of Appeals, which we will be before them, uh, at some point in the future for site approval, we'll be comfortable with a, a change in layout and a reduction in the intensity of, of what's going on on this particular site. So that said, that's a, that's a basic overview of what we're proposing here. If anybody has any questions, 
um, I would Jay, be happy to answer them for you. Jay, before we do that, can we just could you just point out where the um, the grade ramp in in your area where the back garage would need to go, and also the removal of the um, the concrete hatchway there. Okay. All right. Those, those additional so, changes. Yep. Just so let me just let me yep. Let me just blow this up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in terms of meeting the grades back here, we're going to be locating, relocating this pass door, and we'll be sliding it over a little bit with a new overhead door here, and and there'll be a concrete ramp here to get up to the finished floor elevation of the building. We're also removing a entryway here that went into the basement to the basement apartment which we're no longer going to use and in this location and in this location there were and, and I guess for lack of better term and I'm not a building official but there were windows that were suitable for exiting from the basement should there be an emergency situation fire or what have you which are required and those are going to be removed as well because the basement's no longer going to be used for residential purposes and the basement access uh, will be accessed through this door on the front. This is actually a doorway into a stairwell that allows access to the upper floor and the basement. There's also access to the upper floor through this stairwell. So um, those are gonna be removed. Um, there will be a new line striping here uh, to delineate the area to keep the cars a little more orderly and not have cars just parked haphazardly here in the back as they've been in the past. And you can see we're showing proposed line striping in this area. Uh, the proposed line stripe for the for the two vehicles that could be offered for sale as well as proposed line stripe, stripe here. So there'll be a little change in the grade here with a concrete ramp to be able to get up into uh, this bay area when this new overhead door is installed. And I think that's what Dan's referring to. Perfect. Thank you, Jay, for pointing that out. So in summary, we're asking the commission to um, approve the site plan for these building modifications um, for cosmetic and safety reasons, and that the uh, site plan does not create any further nonconformities and the um, anticipated cosmetic improvements will not create any further nonconformities with the King Street, Enfield Street overlay district. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, Commissioner DeGray. Thank you. I have a couple of questions um, and I'll just give you the questions and then you can answer them. First off, I looked at your plan on page two. Your <clears throat> doors don't line up. You're on the um, north and south side. And one of the doors, you're actually going to kind of have to maneuver around that southwest corner of the office where there's gas line connections. And then you show a parking space when you uh, behind the uh, apartment building. And if you line up those doors, you're basically going to come out and into that parking space if a car is parked there you might end up hitting it because it's kind of close and secondly there really isn't any curb frontage on the property and when I pulled in to walk the property I basically just pulled right up right out in front and I was parked right in front of the office door um, got out of my car walked around got back in my car how, how are you going to stop people from actually coming off of Enfield Street and doing that, pulling up right in front of the office doors? I know the building is vacant right now, but how is that going to be prevented? There's no landscaping or curb to stop that. And they're coming off of Route 5, and people use those sidewalks a lot. So... If you could answer those two questions, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, yes. again, for the record, uh, Jay Ursary with J.R. Russo. In terms of the doors in the building, <clears throat> uh, the building itself is 40, 
44, 45 feet wide here. And, and it's a good observation that you have, but there's plenty of room to, for a, a, one of the employees to be able to pull a vehicle in here, get around the corner, come through here and come out. And there is also enough room to come out here without impacting this parking space that's located here. And let me go to the other sheet. If you, if you note here, the space that's delineated at this location um, is not right tight up against the building. There's some room here. And, and that was done purposely to bring this parking space back a little bit should somebody be parked here in, and we're trying to exit through that door. So we're comfortable that there's enough room for the employees to navigate in and out of the building and get through these doors um, and, and make it a little more orderly flow than what was there before. In terms of the curb cuts out here at the roadway, there's obviously a bituminous island that's located here and a bituminous island that's here. And, and, and that's, a, that's a good question, Commissioner DeGray, because if you were to look at it when you drive by, it almost looks like the whole thing is one big wide curb cut. You, you can barely see the curbing. I think the road's been overlaid so many times that it almost looks like you could drive in there from anywhere uh, on the roadway, other than the fact that there's a couple of signs, there's one here and one here that's that's located within those little islands or next to the islands. So uh, I don't know exactly how they dealt with it in the past. I know they always had cars parked here in the front. And <clears throat> I mean, we could certainly add some additional signage at this location, um, indicating that, you know, if somebody were to pull in here that they would only park in front of this door or show parking located here and and, and at nowhere else. Um, you know, I, I don't actually know the answer to that. As, as we said earlier, when we gave an initial explanation, this is a, a long running existing non-conforming use and has been for decades. And um, this is how the place has operated probably for 50, 60, 70 years. I don't even know. And, and, and I have one more question. Yep, what ahead. is the reason you need to pave behind the garage? It's not paved now. Why would you Where? repay? Why would you pave that? Whereabouts? In the back along the fence. It says Here? yes. Way up yeah. right right between the parking lots in the back. Between the uh, along the fence, right along that back wall of the garage. No, it says go to the pay. right, right there, yeah. right there. That's right. existing. That is paved today. It's existing pavement. It's been paved for decades. You didn't look. We're not it. proposing to use it. I, I I don't know if I answered your question. We're not proposing to pave it. It is paved. You didn't look it. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. No. It's it, it as as. As Jennifer pointed out, I think in her memo, essentially this entire property from front to back and side to side, as well as from property line out to the curb line of route five, other than these, and even the bituminous islands, everything on this property is paved. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. I, I just want to clarify something for the record. It, it's been said a bunch of times that this property is non-conforming. It's been operated this way for years and years and years. I, I just want to correct you. First of all, the parking in front of the building didn't exist because there were gas pumps there for years and years and years. Secondly, Purcellos acquired the property to the right on Carpet Street and he used the rear parking lot of that house for parking for this property. And then he purchased the property across the street and he used that for car sales, not mm -hmm. this property. And the lawsuit went on with the town of Enfield for years. And he said that his license included the property across the street. And that's how he got the license because he used that as parking. You've got 18 spots here three of them are inside the building. Well, if you've got those spots occupied, how are you gonna work inside the building? That's the first thing. Second is the location of the dumpster pad with two cars parked 
where you have there for your car sales, how's the truck going to get in there to dump that dumpster? And I'll do like Linda, I'll go through my list. Are there any towing? Is there any towing going to be done on the property? And then you say one space for three 3,000 square feet of um, cars for sale. On a property of this side, you have two spots for used cars. I'm not buying that. Where for Cellos, as you say, he's been doing it for years and years. He used the property across the street, which had space for 100 cars. Um, waste oil and floor drains. WPC did not have any comments. And I really want to see the comments about this because if I'm correct, there's floor drains inside that building. And then, um, and you answered the other one about the new fence with the privacy slats six feet around the property. So um, I would be okay with that being a condition of approval, but I, I'm just very concerned how you're trying to squeeze all this, what Priscillo's had on four properties, not two, how you're trying to reduce it down to two properties where none of the parking exists. The parking was across the street. Well, I can't, um, Dan McKellick from Bacon Wilson for the record. Um, I can't necessarily opine to what Porcello's business model was and what his um, intentions were and how he intended to generate profits and what was the focal point of his business. The focal point here of uh, my client is um, is repair work, as as we've noted in the in the used car sales is is ancillary to that. Okay, um, if the the property the records from the Department of uh, Transportation show that there are records that date back to the 50s relative to these parcels and automobile sales, and whether Porcello accrued, uh, um, acquired some additional parcels of land and whatever he used them for, um, I, same thing, I cannot necessarily opine to that. Um, and we have a determination from the zoning enforcement officer that we have a, a non-conforming property, which, you know, in reality, anything before these regulations dated uh, January 31st, 2003, um, relative to parking is really a question that, that comes up. We're, my client wants to be a good neighbor. He wants to make sure that, um, that everybody's happy and that he's doing the best to make this lot the safest he can in bringing it more into conformity rather than necessarily meeting a standard that a prior operator may have had and how they operated their business or you know what this parcel in code can actually take. Excuse me, Dan. Yes. Uh, I can speak to the property across the street. Uh, it used to be the old Shimmerhorns uh, fish market. I actually sold that to Matt Priscilla back in the 80s and he used it primarily back in those days for the storage of, of vehicles that were all over the over there. Uh, there are pictures around that show in front of the apartment office building. He had two or three cars for sale there. Uh, after the uh, gas tanks came out, and I can't remember exactly when, early 90s or middle 90s or whenever, he had cars parked there and he had them parked over to the left actually where we have two proposed uh, display sites now, uh, he, he had used cars parked over there too. Uh, but the building across the street primarily was not for sales, it was for uh, storage of vehicles. And then at the time he had two wreckers, a car carrier, and then maybe a couple of other service vehicles that, that he used. He had vehicles all the place. So the current buyer is reducing down a lot of what's happened on this building. Primarily, they want to keep the front of the building completely wide open. No parking will be allowed. Uh, no parking signs will be posted, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that answers some of your questions. What about the towing? Are they going to continue to do towing on I'm the property? I'm not going to do any towing. Uh, 
they've agreed to give it up. And I think if you see, read the narrative, uh, I believe there was a mention that there was towing, but there's no intention <clears throat> of doing any towing, whatever. Okay, and then uh, floor drains, waste oil separators. I believe I've seen floor drains in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as separator, is that what you're talking about, like an oil? Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with that, so I, I don't know. Right, that's why I would want comments from WPC in regards to, I know they dug up a lot of the tanks. I'm not sure if they double, uh, dug up the oil separator from all the floor drains in that building, but we really know where they're going to make sure they're not going in the uh, city sewer. And WPC did not comment. And uh, I, I really want to see that. Mm -hmm. And then the last one would be the uh, dumpster, the location of the dumpster, how that truck is going to maneuver to empty that dumpster with those two spots there. At J. Ursri, J. R. Russo, <clears throat> the, the dry vial here between the proposed edge of traveled way and the location of the two cars for sale is 20 feet wide. So there's plenty of room for a, a truck to pull through here and, and pull in and back and pick this dumpster. And, and that's an excellent question. We did think of that. and We looked all over this site thinking, where are we gonna put the dumpster? And, and by essentially flaring this out a little bit, it gives us enough space here to put something for uh, both buildings, whether the, the residential or the or the uh, repair use to be able to get to the dumpster and use it. In terms of the floor drains, I'm gonna be honest, Ken, I've not, I haven't been in this building. My people were in there and measured it. If there are floor drains um, under today's regulations, they would be required to go through a, an oil water separator and they would discharge to the sanitary sewer system. That's where we would want them to go. And, and that's an excellent point. That's something certainly uh, based on the, your concern, the concern of the commission is something we can look into to see whether or not those floor drains are currently functional and connected to an oil water separator. And if they're not, that's certainly something that we can work out through the WPCA to make sure that, the, that they are connected properly. Right, okay. Um, that's all I have for right now. So we have uh, Commissioner Suzak. I believe you. Yeah, I have a couple of questions in terms of I, I, you know, one of my concerns was the fact that this this lot is appears to be, you know, 100 percent impervious. And and you keep saying that you're, you're going to eliminate any parking in front of these buildings. And, and what I'm, I'm wondering is, is that, you know, the town is encouraging landscaping to, to again, provide some you know, softness to the, to, you know, the environment that we have, you know, along that, you know, Enfield Street. And, and why wouldn't you like remove all the paving that's in front of the building and just install grass or, and trees and landscaping so that it would enhance the appearance of, you know, all that area that's there. And for sure, you're not going to be parking there, you know, in, in, in accordance to Commissioner DeGray's, you know, concerns that, you know, you can totally eliminate it by just getting rid of the, the, the paving, putting in some grass and trees and landscaping, and it'll definitely improve your property. The other question I have is that, you know, you mentioned the ramp that's going to be going into the south side of, you know, the, the, the largest structure. And I'm wondering, is, is that going to impede, you know, parking spot number nine? You know, the thing is, you know, right now you have a parking spot number nine and you know it, 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 if there's a ramp that's going to be you know i guess north of or you know to the west of parking lot parking lot spot number 10 then you know somewhere you know you can't have it and then again i don't know what the change of grade is. is is it going to be a four foot change of grade is it a 10 foot change of grade is it a two foot change of grade or or, you know, so, and how long would that ramp be if you were gonna put that ramp there? And, and like you said, would it impede on nine? Cause my, and, and my, my last concern is the fact that when I look at the office, I notice that there's two office rooms and there's only one space for two office rooms. And 
And, you know, if, if there's two rooms, then normally you would expect that there's two people there. And then, then there's two cars associated with two rooms for two people. Um, and, you know, if, if you're saying that, you know, there's one space associated with the outdoor display area. So where's the guy who's going to be looking at those outdoor display areas going to park if he, there's no parking spot for him? So, you know, I think, I think that, you know, that the parking count, you know, possibly should be reviewed and the fact that we shouldn't be hindering any of the spaces that are there and showing, you know, the being a good neighbor and showing the fact that we want to enhance, you know, this landscaping that we have, you know, in, in that section of town, you know, it, it definitely would, would set a, you know, a step in the right direction as to, you know, what we want to see. And, and we definitely want to see landscaping because landscaping just enhances the environment and, and causes, you know, a softer condition to, uh, you know, exist, you know, all around. Thank you, Rich. Um, I, I have one more thing too, I want to add that goes along with Commissioner Suzak. If you were to landscape the front of the building, you would eliminate the use of this overhead door here. And many years ago, there was a car in this bay and the customer got in the car, backed out of the bay, put her foot on the gas instead of the brake, backed right out on the roof five and she was killed. And the grade here is, it's a pretty good grade so if you, you know, working on a car and the car rolls down or somebody doesn't put their emergency brake on, it is going to roll right into Route 5. There is no curbing. There's nothing to stop a car from continuing into Route 5, which is a huge safety concern and a, a tragic accident has already happened. So along with what Commissioner Suzak saying, if this was grass, then you would never have that situation because you wouldn't be able to come across I just wanted to bring that You're up. Discussing the, the three bays on the Route 5 side? Yes. Yeah. That, well, we would need to obtain access to the three overhead doors. And if that was all grass and landscaped, um, that would prohibit the access to that. I'm sure that, you know, we can entertain something along those, along the sides to, you know, whether they're, um, the large floral pots or something along those lines, you know, whatever it may be that act as almost like a, a fancy Jersey barrier um, in certain areas to help and along with the signage that was discussed previously to be sure that, um, you know, that to help ensure that nobody is, is using that as a, as a driveway and they're going out the right exit and they're going in the right entrance. Um, these spots here that we're talking about, the three overhead doors, those are regulated for employees and only employees would be pulling the cars into the, um, into the base, you know, after the cars dropped off for a repair. Um, and then they would be parking their cars in, in 16 and 17 would be two employee parking spots if they're needed. Well, how would you park a customer's car there if the employees park there? I've yeah. never seen counting, you know, your required parking where your overhead doors are that you're going to work on customers' cars. I, I brought that up before, so. Yeah, no, no, I, I understand completely. And, um, you know, we're just trying to, we're trying to get as close to the regulation as possible. Um, although the regulation doesn't, you know, necessarily apply because of non-core conformity. Um, and we're just trying to, we're decreasing the existing use of what's going on there. And we're trying to accommodate for everybody's concerns. For everybody's concerns. Um, the reality of it is there's, um, you know, I know that we mentioned the dumpster, the wrecker, and these other cars. We got to remember too that we have a business owner here who's trying to sell those two cars that are out there. So they're not, they're going to make sure that their dumpster guys are careful. And if they have to move them for whatever reason, snow removal, whatever, they would move them. Um, when lot parking spot nine came into question in 10, it's the same thing. They're going to have their own customers' cars there. 
And if they damage those cars, then you know, they're gonna have to pay. So they're gonna exercise as much caution and care as possible relative to that. And the tenant parking can be further away. There's section, you know, spots two, three, four, you know, and five, you know, further away from the entrance into the building. But the plan here was just, you know, we understand just looking at it that there are some concerns with traffic flow and safety. And we're just trying to make it as, as safe as possible and, and provide these proposed plans and say, listen, you know, this is, this is how we can get there. So yes, we do have some internal parking spots and they are willing to sacrifice how many bays they put into operation so we can comply. And no, the property will not be able to generate as much money for them, you know, whether it's two used cars or four used cars. Originally, we we're looking at four, but we just couldn't make it all work, you know, so the, 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 the owner is willing to take the hit on that. And that's a, that's a financial hit in the, in a business interest in the decision that they made. Right. Again, you went back to this is non-conforming and they've done it for years, but you're forgetting about the other two parcels that they had to acquire to make what you want to do work because this parcel is so small and so tight. If you were willing to give up the apartment building you know, there used to be an impound yard behind it that was full of cars. Um, it, then you'd be a less non-conforming use. You still have the same footprints on the property and you're trying to do the same exact thing minus the big parking lot across the street and the side parking lot. Um, so. But we're, uh, I just, just to reiterate, cause I, I want to make sure that we're not running an impound lot though, like they were. I, I understand. We're not right, selling, right. we're not anticipating selling the volume um, <clears throat> used cars that maybe they did. We're not operating a wrecker. Um, you know, all of these things dramatically decrease that. And the, the determination of non-conforming runs with this land, 710 to 718. The property rights that are vested here and protected by constitutional law all recognized by the highest courts in Connecticut and the, and the statutes that govern it, um, govern the, uh, the zoning rules, section 8.2 of the, of the code um, are very clear on all that. And we're not, you know, we don't wanna come in here, you know, blazing saying, you know, we don't wanna do anything. We don't have to do anything. We're trying to do something to, to make it best. Is there a current repairs license and sales license on this property? Current, I do okay. not think so. I but those are. For, is there? Is there? Freaking phone. Sorry. Current, Seriously. I don't believe they are, and those are personal in nature anyway. They would. Have, they don't run. Those don't run with the land. I, I understand, but when I opened a garage down the street in 2000, my license, the license on the building expired for 12 months. Therefore, the grandfather was expired because they deemed it that the use had expired because the active license had been lapsed by the owner. And therefore, I had to go through the whole process again, start to finish, to get approvals in place for this. Now, you're saying this place doesn't have an active license on any of it. No sales license, no repairs license, nothing. Two of the parcels that made this work have been sold off. So um, Connecticut law is up for interpretation. Um, Commissioner um, Alamo. I, thanks, sorry. oh, sorry. Am I up, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I really like this because it's bringing back um, to me, the original Purcell's garage, um, more so than it was in the last 25 years of it. Um, I'm very familiar with this property, being uh, born and brought up in Thompsonville. Uh, as I remember as a little kid pulling up in front and getting gasoline with my parents and uh, back when the Purcell's Chick and uh, Jimmy were running it, this is prior to Maddie buying in or Maddie coming into the picture. Um, it's bringing it back more to the old days to where it originally, originally was. It didn't become um, what it was at the end until its second half or maybe a third, not even, maybe a third of the life of the history here. 
to me, it's an historical um, uh, area. It has a little sentimental value. Um, and to see them come in here and really bring it back to what it really, really was 50 years ago. Um, I don't know how the old, the old business arrangement was, but Maddie was never involved. It was Chick and Jimmy and Tony years ago when I was a little kid. Um, they had left the business. Maddie came in, and that's when all the drastic changes happen here. And God rest all their souls. They're all very nice family. But this proposal, to me, is bringing it back to really what it was in the beginning. And I don't think Chick and uh, Tony towed back in those days. I think the Trianos did all the towing. So to me, uh, we have a couple of issues about floor drains and sort of things to work out. And if we could work those things out and get answers that those questions need to be answered. I really, really like this. Um, I reviewed the environmental studies and environmental reports. It seems like everything's been cleaned up, up to code. Um, I read the fire marshal's letter and uh, he doesn't have any problems with this. So what has become an eyesore and a real shame to somebody who's part of this area of town and grew up and went here as a little kid. You know, this is really part of Thompsonville and the historical part of Thompsonville and the businesses of Thompsonville that once were there that made this area great back in the day. So for me to see someone come in here and clean this up and bring it back to what it was, I think it's a great idea. Um, again, so uh, I, I like it. And if there's some issues out there that uh, need to be taken care of, look, Chairman, you mentioned the floor drains, uh, those sorts of things. Other things that other commissioners have some issues with, maybe some plantings or, you know, he talked about flower pots for a decorative that uh, Priscilla brothers used to have tomato plants out front in big baskets um, back in the day. So it was a very nice place. It was a family run business. And to me, this is really bringing it back to what it was, not to what Maddie had at the end. And again, I'm not dissing any of the Priscillas. I know them all. They're all nice people. But this is back, going back to the original. Thank you. I, I like this very much. Thank you, Commissioner Alimo. Jennifer, did you want to add something? Um, yes. I heard your concerns, uh, Chairman, about um, your previous facility at um, up the street. Um, and I did a little digging. And what I'm guessing might have been the cause of that 12-month um, lapse causing you having to go back through the process um, is because that was actually written into the zoning regulations at one point. That's no longer in the zoning regulations. Um, and I know that the statutes have changed and there was a memo that went out um, regarding non-conforming uses, but essentially the non-conforming uses, whether the license still is stands or not, are still legal non-conforming uses for these properties, even if they were in connection with other properties. Um, I know that uh, the applicants had talked to staff about um, Porcello's having used the property across the street on Carpet Street for parking. We couldn't find an approval on in our records for that. Um, so we let them know that. Um, but I, I just wanted to let you know that I did look into previous regulations and I did see that there was something for that 12 month lapse in K7 form, um, but that is no longer in our regulations today. Okay, so I'm not losing my mind. I am correct. <laughs> that was there. It's not there anymore. Okay, thank you very much for looking that up, Jen. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Grillo. Thank you. Um, so on that back over by where parking spot number 10 is, is that where you were going to propose to put that uh, the, uh, overhead door in? right over by uh, 10 uh, next to the walkout door. Uh, for the record, Jay Air Street. Yeah, if you take a look here at where my cursor is, there is a proposed overhead door here. And I think, I don't remember who asked the question. Somebody asked a similar question earlier. And then the, the pass door would be moved down to this location. and. And here's the, the back of the, the apartment on the first floor, if you will. So let me just flip back here quickly to the other sheet. On my print, I didn't see that overhead door. And the reason why I asked is 
where that door is right now, there are steps there. Yeah, and, and that door, ran. and that that's a very good question. And and somebody else asked it. This door, this pass door is is going to be moved, and the overhead door actually goes essentially where this pass door is and then moving westerly if you will so there is enough room to get out here and we also as i had said earlier move this parking spot number 10 away from the building to give it again a little bit more ease of maneuverability to be able to get in and out of here and as 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 dan had said uh, earlier this maneuvering of cars through here are all by employees and staff of the facility. So uh, although if it were you or I maybe going through it, we might be a little concerned, but uh, the, the buyers are, are comfortable with this situation and how we're proposing it. We feel that it certainly helps uh, in terms of the vehicular flow in and out and back and forth through the building compared to what it is today. So I, we're comfortable with it. We, we, we're we comfortable that it'll work and the proposed buyer is comfortable with it, it that it can work. But okay. but it is a good question and I understand it. That's um, not my concern. My concern is that there's going to be steps right there. You have a parking spot right there. You have to build a ramp from that building out. Now, that ramp's got to be to code. What, what's that? A quarter inch? per That ramp's if that is only two feet up, and I'm just guessing, I didn't see how high that door is. It's that, pretty high. Okay, that ramp's got to come out almost 20. You only have, it looks to me like what, nine, 9.6 feet in, be, in, in between the building and the front. It's a, a little over to 11, eight. So wouldn't that parking spot, when they go to pull out, when they hit the bottom of the ramp, or some part of that ramp coming off the building, that's that's what I'm trying to figure out right here. I'm measuring it out right now, and that seems pretty tight to me. I'm, I'm going off the big sheet. Okay, are you looking at the one that I've got the cursor on now, or are you looking at the other I'm one? Straight at it. I'm looking at that one right now. I don't, I don't. Okay, no, that's a good question, because you're right. There's some stairs here and steps to get up into the building. And as I said, the overhead door is going here. This ramp is, it's not a handicap ramp, so it doesn't meet the handicap code. This is a ramp to drive a vehicle in and out of the building. So it doesn't have to meet the handicap accessibility code to get in and out of the building. As this pass door is moved over, it's still gonna have some steps. And I think uh, Commissioner Suzak asked a similar question, which I, I didn't get an opportunity to answer yet. And I think his concern was, you know, with this ramp, is it going to impact the vehicle trying to back in and out of or come out of space number nine? And those, are, these are both good questions, and I'm I'm glad you brought them up. But we're not looking at a handicap ramp; we're looking at a ramp to get up to the floor level of the building. And as you can see, this area is already all torn up, and it's going to maybe require a little modification in here. But we're comfortable that we can make this work to get the ramp functional to get a vehicle in and out. And, and allow some parking and, and all of the vehicles to make it in and out of the parking space. So again, just to reiterate it, it's not a handicap ramp at one on 12 that'll, that'll end up stretching out out into here somewhere. That's not what we have here. Well, I, I, I understand that. Thank you for, for clearing buying up, but it's still, if that step is three to four feet or high, I, that ramp still got to be over 10 feet, right? I mean, or a car couldn't really get over that top hump. It, it, it really de determines on how high that step is off that door. Um, a, a ramp, I, I, I get it, but you can't have a straight up ramp for your employees. They come in with one of them Hondas or something to, to bottom out going over it. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, it, you got nine feet of space. I'm more concerned about 10. I see what uh, Commissioner Suzak said about number nine, but more about 10 too. No, it's a good Jay, question, said, but we're not, we're not dealing with three or four feet here. I think there's two risers to get up into the building. So as I recall it, so at two risers, you know, we're looking at inches, we're not looking at feet. So if we've got two risers at seven well, or eight inches each, we're comfortable that we can get the ramp out there and make it all work with some so if I, if I recall minor regrading in this area. Okay. If I recall correctly too, it actually grades down. So it's 
it's not as high by the parking spot and it's higher off of grade level down by the chain link fence side of the building. So wouldn't that so make it, it slopes down towards the chain link fence a little bit. So you, where, where that parking spot is, is actually at a, a higher altitude. And, and you can see it on the, on the wall that comes up like that where the proposed ramp is, you know, that area. Thank you. Yeah, you don't have the grades because if I'm correct, it's not two or three inches, it's two to three feet. No, I, I didn't say inches. I said, I believe there's two risers here at the step. So if there are two risers at seven to eight inches a piece, we're looking at something in 14, maybe 16 inches in grade differential here. So it obviously will require a ramp and probably a little regrading out here. But as I said, we're, we're comfortable that we can make that work and, and with some repaving and some, some slight modification of the grades to get the ramp up into the building. But it's, a, it's an excellent question. I mean, I thought the same thing when I first started looking at this before I went out to the site and actually looked at it. So is it possible that at the next meeting you could bring a revised plan with the grades, with the ramp, with the new location of the doors um, and what's proposed instead of what's existing? I can't hear you, Jay, you're muted, sorry. Let me, all right, I'm sorry. The floor plan does show the door locations, but unfortunately maybe it would be better if they were both on the same plan. So in other words, the site plan showing the proposed door locations so you can see how it all fits together in relation. And, and yes, we could do that if, if you'd like to see that. You know, cause I definitely wanna see the, gra the grading, the drainage, you know, what is, uh, what's gonna prevent the water from building up in the uh, corner between your ramp and um, the corner of the multifamily home in that area there. You know, if the water, if it is sloping, like you said, you know, that ramp's gonna end up being like a little dam. Actually, right, right now, Ken, I think the water runs right out between the two buildings out towards the street. Okay, that's why I'd like to see something with the grade lines, because that would work if that's the case there. Yeah, I believe it does. Yeah. Okay. Um, Linda, did you want to speak again? Yeah, I, I, as we were talking and we were talking about dumpsters and that, what about car carriers? How is that going to work? You're selling cars. Um, so I'm going to assume, and that could be my problem, assuming that you're going to go buy cars at an auction and you're going to buy more than one at a time and you're not going to be able to drive it. So you're talking about a car carrier coming. Um, how is that going to fit into this with um, residents parking, customers parking? How are you going to... I, I, I'm just curious because they can't be parked on the street. Carpet, Carpet Street is a very small, narrow street and residents do live down off of that. So um, I'm a little concerned about car carriers popping up and safety issues with that. Because again, we have no way to stop them from just pulling in off of Enfield Street and pulling right out in front of these properties. Again, for the record, Jay Ursary with J.R. Russo. Uh, assuming they get some cars that are going to be listed for sale or put up for sale that might come in on a car carrier, I would expect that that particular car carrier would probably pull down Carpet Street um, and, and they would unload the vehicle, which could then come into the building in this location, it would truck would back in and turn around and go back out. And, and I would expect that's probably the way they did it in the past. I, I'm, I'm worried about that, pulling it down on Carpet Street because it is such a narrow street dead end. and a dead end and there are houses down there. And I forget the name of the street that goes off to the right on that too. And there's some houses, 
several houses down there. Sanford Avenue. I don't, I'm not sure it would be anything different than a delivery truck going to some of these residences. On occasion, you have it. And, um, you know, they would do everything as, as safe as they possibly can and instruct drivers that tow there. Um, I'm sure a lot of the cars would be driven in from auction. They, I don't think they come on the record too often, but, um, you know, there's enough auction houses local for them to pick up cars. And then they also have the opportunity to follow the same route as the, um, as the dumpster truck in the, in the trash hauler to come through there to, to, to minimize the danger to any surrounding properties. And, you know, once again, this isn't, uh, you know, this is not a towing operation, you know, where they're, they're getting paid to haul as many vehicles and, and hold as many vehicles in storage as they can, like an impound lot would be. They're just gonna have- I realize you're not towing, but I'm concerned you're selling vehicles. Mm -hmm. and you go to the auction, they get loaded up. I go by the auction mm -hmm. every week. I see the car, car carriers. Mm -hmm. They can carry two cars, they can carry whatever, but I'm concerned about car carriers coming out and stopping on Enfield Street, parking, or parking on Carpet Street on such a narrow road, and or on a busy road. So that's a real concern I, I have. Again, Jay Ursry, J.R. Russo here representing the applicant. I, I think it's a good concern. Um, if this were a large used car operation, I, I think it's a legitimate concern. But in this case, we're showing two used car spaces for sale. And, and I as well am very familiar with the auction. And Many, many, many of the cars that leave the auction are driven out of the auction on dealer plates. They're not loaded on car carriers. They're not put on big trucks. They're driven to wherever they go. And in many cases, it may be halfway across the country, but it happens every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, throughout the week. So not every car that leaves the auto auction leaves on a truck. I'm gonna say there's a fairly large percentage of them that are actually driven to wherever the owner is who bought them. They don't always leave on trucks. And in this case, because of the size of this operation, I would say that that's probably what's likely to happen here. All set, Linda. Uh, yeah, as long as we can make a condition, the no care carrier parking on Enfield Street or Carpet Street, that, that would be my biggest <laughs> thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Suzak, did you want to speak again? Rich? No, I'm all set. Yeah, I, I got one. I do have one more question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is the name of this facility Bar Tools or Bar Tools? <laughs> Tools. I've seen both and, and, and it, I still don't understand which one it is. Bot it is Batool, B-A-T-O-O-L. Okay. Rich, so that's my fault. No I, I, no I misspelled R. it. Right, I misspelled it a couple of times. So I'll take the blame for that because it, when it was first uh, given to me and, and explained to me, I thought it was bar tool and I spelled it that way a couple of times and that's my fault. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Higley. Jenny. Okay, sorry. No I noticed that several people commented on the uh, ability to park in the front of the building, the large building. And since it's a commercial building, I would think that there should be some fire lane striping. So if you put fire lane striping with the no parking signs, then you can get the fire marshal involved if there's any uh, uh, really big uh, problem with the parking. And that's what I had. That's a good point. Good point, Jenny. Thank you. Commissioner Alimo, did you wanna speak again? Yes, thank you. Um, Linda, just for your concerns about going down carpet, and getting back out. 
I know we were always able to get the fire trucks down there, go on to Sanford. I haven't been down in a while. I think there's a little, like a turnaround down there, like a little cul-de-sac. So even as the trucks got bigger later in my career, we always were able to, uh, to get in there. We actually had a house fire right, um, right at the west property line there. It was actually one of the Purcellos residents. Um, and we were able to get our equipment in there and fight that fire and do what we had to do. So just I'll maybe help you out a little bit on your concerns. Um, the other thing I did notice on the plan in the waiting room, customer waiting room, I don't see a restroom. I think I see a restroom for the employees, right? Yeah, and that behind that first bit, yeah, that looks like it's for the employees. Is there a restroom for the waiting room? I don't see that unless I'm missing it. Thank you. Frank, I can answer that. Just like the old fashioned gas stations, there are two bathrooms on the north wall. Oh, that's right. They're still there? Yes, they are. Oh, wow. You're welcome and to I, use them anytime. You can still use <laughs> them. I remember those now that you say that, Bob. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If they meet code and everything and uh, it's fine with everybody else, uh, I'm good with that. Okay. Any other commissioners? Seeing none. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we continue site plan review um, 1846 to our next meeting because there's some outstanding questions and some documentation that we requested and you know it would help us make a decision as to you know what direction we're going to go. Okay, second. I agree with. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. I think everybody knows what we're looking for. Uh, a current site plan with elevations, um, uh, answers about floor drains, where they go. If there's a oil separator still in the parking lot, um, that is in working condition. If there is, then the floor drains would be acceptable if WPC signs off on them. Um, potentially doing fire lanes in front of the building, maybe we could put that on the updated site plan as Commissioner Higley brought up. And then um, one of the conditions I would want for approval is it is limited to not, not to exceed two cars for sale at any one time on this property. And then like Commissioner DeGray said, I also would agree with no loading or unloading of any vehicles on any public roadway um, for safety reasons. But those are the, uh, the conditions that I've written down that I think the um, commission has, unless I miss one. Everybody mm -hmm. in agreement? Yep. That's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lori or Jen, do you have anything you want to add? I don't have anything else. Neither do I. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And hopefully we see you um, at the next meeting. Yes. Thank great. you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank have you a for great night. Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. Could we possibly move the 824 referral to the end of the meeting as uh, our consultant, Don Poland, is, is here and waiting to give sure. his presentation? Is that next or are we, are we gonna move? Yeah, that's next. That's next anyways, isn't it, Lori? Right. We've got the 824 referral, which won't right. take long, but. Well, why don't we, isn't that what you're asking us to do? No. The she wants to move it. Don, Don Poland's here. Oh, 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 oh. Sure. Actually, he's disappeared. Oh, there he uh, is. You know what? Go ahead. He's not even on screen, so. Okay. Let's uh, just do the 824 referral. It'll be quick. Site plan review B, 8-24 referral for the purchase of 8 Moody Road. 
Right, so basically the uh, town is trying to purchase approximately seven acres um, over by the police and public works uh, garage so they can create a larger campus. And uh, basically the town council has all but approved this, but realize that they need to get an 824 referral. Questions? Because Lori, is that 1.07 acres, not seven acres? Six. What well, it's it's actually one point seven and and six point something. So it's approximately seven acres total. Okay. All right. Okay, so it basically, so we'll just like and if you look at the map, which I don't have up. Oh, I can't. I I don't have that up. But basically, it just um, creates a this large um, municipal campus area. Okay. Yep. I know the town's been working on it for years and years. So. All right. No, I see. So, so there are there are two parcels there. Any other questions? I'll entertain a sure, motion. I'll make a, I'll make a motion that we forward a positive recommendation to the town council for the purchase of Eight Moody Road, Map Seventy Five, Lot Thirty One, I One Zone, Map Seventy Five, Lot Thirty Elm Street, I One Zone for future municipal needs. Second. Second. Motions made and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Ken Nelson. Four. Linda DeGray. Four. Virginia Higley. Four. Frank Alimo. Four. John Petronella. Four. Vinny Grillo. Four. And Richard Suzak is four. All in favor, none against. Okay. I think that's it since Don abandoned us and we moved him to next meeting. So uh, I think we're done. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Other business, zoning regulations update. Welcome, Don. How you doing tonight? Good evening. I'm doing well. Thank you. Oh, my timing could have been better than that. So, uh, so you guys have a document before you. Hopefully that you've had a chance to take a look at. I can just refresh your memories a little bit going back to last month. Uh, we started a discussion, I think it was last month or the month before, we started a discussion regarding uh, uses. And you guys had asked me to kind of come up with my list for me to go through the table of uses and make a recommendation to you. So I just want to be clear that this is like a preliminary starting point for a discussion in that I went through, reviewed the zoning regs, looked at the zoning map, the districts, I took a drive around town looking at some areas, and then essentially went through and made modifications to your tables of uses based on what I think as a planner uh, would be acceptable kind of uh, uses per zone. And to be honest with you, uh, I was actually kind of surprised. Now you may be looking at my changes and be like, oh my God. Uh, but actually I didn't make as many or as drastic changes as I would have, as I have expected from what I know of your regs, what I know of your community. I actually thought the changes would have been a lot more significant. And what I mean by that is uh, I expected to remove more uses from zones that I actually did. And I expected to add more new uses to zones than I actually did. And what I, what I ended up doing really was changing the permit process. And that is mostly taking things that were special permit and moving them uh, to site plan. I also, in doing so, I made some changes to what you call uses, just for example, uh, places of worship, I changed to religious institutions, because you could have a religious use that's not a place of worship, uh, you know, a religious community center or something along that lines, that's not actually a, uh, a ceremonial establishment. And I kept those highlighted in red, so where you thought, so you'd see those changes that I made. Also, as I said to you, one of the things that did surprise me, and it was in the intro to my memo, 
was just these kind of two themes that ran through. Uh, as I already stated, one, I feel there's an over-reliance on special permits. Don't feel insulted by that. I would say that to most communities that I deal with. Uh, but number two was the idea that you did have a lot of uses that were allowed via site plan in your, what I would call more community scaled zones that then required special permits in your more regional scale or your more intensive zones. And that's one of the areas where I found myself um, making changes. And it just didn't seem, at least to me, being kind of logical that you want those more intensive uses in those more intensive zones. Why would you put them through a more challenging permitting process? That was kind of my thought process. And to help with some of my thought process, as I have uh, pointed you to, I ended the document with kind of notations of, uh, I tried to take notes and just kind of jot down thoughts I was having as I made these changes. So there's kind of these annotated notes at the end of the document to give you some greater context to what I was thinking. If you'll let me just if you will indulge me just for one moment, sorry, I'm scrolling here quickly, uh, trying to find what I'm looking for. Ah, the child daycare use, you have adult and child daycare. <clears throat> I just want to use this as an example. This, this, is, this is one of those uses that I look at it and say, why is this requiring a special permit? because I end up asking myself the question, what is it about this use? What are the characteristics about it that pose kind of a threat or challenge to the area or neighboring uses? And at the end of the day, children don't really pose a threat, right? And it's also a use that's regulated by the state. And the state has very strict requirements on percentage of green space, which they define as percentage of outdoor recreation area that be provided based on the square footage of the facility or the number of student number of children that are being cared for in the facility. And they have additional requirements as to fencing, security, so forth and so on. So I end up asking the question, what is it from a land use perspective that elevates this use to a higher level of concern justifying the special permit. And in some ways, that's kind of a thought process I go through whenever I'm looking at a special permit and saying, ah, I think this should maybe be site plan. So I think with that as an introduction, because I don't want to do what I attempted to do last time and go through use by use, uh, I think I'd like to stop talking now and kind of put it back to you guys for either A, questions you may have of me and this document, and B, you know, take any comments or concerns that you may have with this. And once again, just saying this is the starting point for a conversation as we go through this lengthy process of updating the regulations. Nothing is final. There's been no decisions. Uh, just me presenting to you what you asked me. Don, could I ask a quick question? Sure. You have you have um, the letter R in the chart. Have you explained what that is? Yeah, I thought I had corrected it. <laughs> I corrected some of them, and I realized I didn't catch all of them. I believe in your regulations in one section, uh, you guys use the letter R and I think it is uh, approved via zoning permit. So it would be letter Z uh, in this table if it were correct. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Frank Alimo, Commissioner Alimo. Commissioner Alimo. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put my hand down. Okay, Commissioner DeGray. Yes, I'm seeing questions tonight. 
Okay. Uh, commercial district in Hazardville. I think I emailed you the com the the question already. Adult, child daycare, and then we have child daycare center. Is there some big difference that I don't know? I mean, it's I don't uh, care. Actually, that's a really good question. That 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 is a really good question. Uh, I'm not sure I caught that. And that makes me pleased that I actually made the same recommendation. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Number two is though, if, if, and I just don't know off the top of my head, if that's not a regulation using all those phrases, then I may have been thinking ahead in the sense of, I know I did think at one point that you may want to split adult daycare from child daycare as two separate uses. Because as I said, the state regulations on child daycare, I think are more significant than those on adult. And adult daycare facilities can have not typically full blown, you know, dementia patients or Alzheimer's, but they may have persons with struggling capacities. And maybe, I'm not, I'm not convinced yet, but maybe there is an additional concern there that it justifies its own classification. I will, uh, I'll, I'll double check that to make sure whether or, not, or to check whether it was me or whether it was the regs using both those phrases. So we just well, put the word child on the top well, one. I'm, yeah, but I'm just thinking that if they're regulated by the state, both of them, and if we look at his recommendation, they're all um, a site plan. Uh, across either the daycare or the adult slash di child daycare. So yep. uh, if if we go that way, and I'm not saying that's you know the be all end all, but if you could tell us if there's some huge differences, I would be great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll I'll look into the adult daycare and find out the specific regulations. I mean, you see all of my comments as I get them my question so <laughs> <laughs> okay commissioner suzak I, I i guess you know just just yeah, this this discussion about the adult and in a child daycare facilities and wider special permits is i think that what we what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the public informed as to what we're doing in in their neighborhood and allow them to actually comment on whether they're for or against and you know not necessarily that it's going to you know change our way of thinking but sometimes what we don't want to do is just freeze the public out and not allow them to comment on on anything and and with a special permit they're allowed to comment on a site plan review they're not and and, and i think that you know just to be transparent and inclusive and not necessarily force something upon you know a, a re, you know an abutting resident you know that you know he should have the opportunity to to at least make a comment to us rather than you know just get it through the mail that oh by the way your neighbor just now has a child daycare versus you know well, well I didn't know that and and why couldn't I have any input for that so and even if we don't agree at least he'll be able to blame us that he you know the government is trying to do things behind his back, but at least it, it allows him to comment on that. It, and I think that, you know, that's where, where you know, the, the difference is, is that, you know, how transparent and how inclusive do we want to keep our neighbors or, you know, our residential, you know, supporters versus, you know, just saying, you know, we're going to do something regardless of, you know, what your opinion is. And that, you know, and, and not that necessarily it's going to sway our opinion, if, if they meet all the requirements, then we, we have to approve them. But at least it allows them to give us a comment as to, you know, how do they feel? And, and you know, sometimes it's better to, to at least be able to comment rather than for the rest of your life say, I never, you know, had the opportunity. I never had the opportunity. And I think that's the reason why. So, and, and if, you, if you will let me, I, I'd like to just, you know, respond back to that. And it, it's not it's not me pushing back or anything, but from a 
planning and land use perspective, I react in a number of different ways to, the, to that. One, I definitely get the idea of public interest, public comment, being transparent, and I, and I applaud you for that. But the other reactions I have to that is one, the idea of zoning is that it provides a reasonable expectation to anyone to know what uses are permitted or not within a zone. So whether it's specially permitted or permitted, there is this assumption that property owners are well informed and should be aware of uh, you know, what is permitted. Number two, my other reaction to it is then from kind of the applicant side and the special permit and, and the uh, economic development side of it. Uh, oftentimes when I work for developers, more on the market research side than the land use side, I'm often asked to do an evaluation, you know, as we're coming up with sites or thinking through, you know, where a development can go, I'm often asked to do an evaluation of the zoning regs and the computing, on the competing sites. And the special permit is always a red flag because it raises a question mark as to whether or not we can get an approval. And there is always that fear that if enough residents show up and yell and scream at you guys, that it will change your opinion. And when I say that, I mean collective commissions, not just you guys. Uh, so that's always in the back of my mind is this idea of, you know, if, if you want investment, it should be kind of the path to least resistance, quick, simple, certain. And the special permit raises kind of a question mark. And on the developer side, it ends up being, well, if we have two similar sites and one's a site plan, one's a special permit, where are we going? Most likely to the site plan, not the special permit. So that's my second reaction to that. My third reaction, and this, this one I'll, I'll just have a little fun with, uh, why beat yourselves up as a commission? Why, why beat yourselves up with a bunch of angry residents? And this is nothing against the residents. Uh, when at the end of the day, you said it, if it meets the standards, you need to approve it. So in some ways, I feel like you're making yourself work harder or more challenging when you don't need to. Fourth, uh, why do you want to spend all your commission meetings dealing with public hearings and having really late nights? Uh, so there's a workload kind of idea to this. So I think there's many ways of looking at this, and I'm not trying to say that transparency, public input isn't valuable. I'm just trying to put a number of perspectives and what goes through my mind when I'm looking at these. So, oh, last little footnote. You always can, if you want to allow, I, I don't necessarily recommend it, but you can allow public comment on a site plan if you so choose. Once again, I feel you're beating yourself up because if it complies, you have to approve. So you're kind of maybe giving a false sense of security to the residents that their voice is going to matter in the decision. Uh, where it's less likely on a site plan than on a special permit where you have some subjectivity in your decision. So. We, just, we just went through this very thing with Wynn Stanley and it was wrong to have a public hearing because it didn't matter what they said, we had to approve it. And nothing, I would have been so mad as a resident if you said my ver voice could be heard and then you ignored what I said. So yes. why would you even let me talk? And I think that upset the residents way more than if you just said, look, these are the regulations. We have to follow them. If we don't like them, we've got to change them. And that's what you're here for is to change the regulations <laughs> that don't fit, you know? And, you know, we sit here and not everybody's going to like every decision we make. Some people like them, some people hate them. So yeah. we just, we're dealt with a, a Bible we have to go by and our personal opinions don't matter. No matter yep. how many people yell at us, <laughs> we have to follow the regulation. Yeah, understood. So going back to my first night, you know, I'm here to challenge you guys, push you guys, engage you in the conversation. And on the back end of this, hopefully we come out with a better set of regulations. And, you know, as you do push back on me, 
and we'll figure it out. As I said, I'm always taking your temperature and trying to figure out where I can push and not push and so forth. And so forth. Great. Uh, Commissioner Petronella, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Poland, I certainly agree with your, uh, uh, um, your, your comments on site plan versus um, uh, special use uh, and so forth. Uh, I, and I believe I commented on that at, at our last meeting, but I, I still agree with you in, in, in your, uh, um, your comments on how to deal with that and many of the changes that you made reflecting that. Um, one quick note on page three under note uh, two, somewhat minor, but as it, as it pertains to bed and breakfast, things, boarding houses and rooming houses, it says must maintain an appearance of owner occupied residential buildings. Uh, I, I was thinking we shouldn't, uh, should that also be uh, not only maintain the appearance, but should also be owner occupied? Uh, something we may want to just discuss on that. Uh, one would think that a bed and breakfast and boarding houses should be owner occupied. Yeah, so, so that's one of the areas, just so you know, I believe currently your regulation groups those two uses together, that it's bed and breakfast and rooming house. In the table above on the prior page, I break it out in the two separate uses. I, I believe there's truly a distinction between what is a bed and breakfast mm -hmm. and what is a rooming house. So as I believe I said in the introductory uh, page, some of these notes are gonna have to be adjusted to reflect changes in the end. And this is one of those that's gonna have to be split and adjusted. A bed and breakfast should always be owner occupied. That's a definite, I agree with you 100% there. Uh, the owner occupancy of a rooming house is debatable. I know there are circumstances where they are owner occupied, and I know there are circumstances where they are not. And we can have a discussion around, you know, what you guys, A, how it's been handled previously, and B, how you would like to handle it moving forward. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner DeGray. Just one more thing. Um, is there any regulations on Airbnbs? I'm, I, I know that in my line of business, we have people that take their apartments and turn them into Airbnbs and it's a nightmare. And I'm sure it's happening at houses, but is there any regulations anywhere state that regulates Airbnbs? So Airbnbs uh, typically have not been regulated at the state level. Uh, some states have reacted to them and done some taxing and so forth around them, but not really occupancy or use regulations. Uh, they have become very controversial in many larger cities around the country and around the globe. And cities like San Francisco, I believe, uh, even London, England, have adopted very strict Airbnb regulations uh, due to pushback from the hotel industry that feels they've been harmed by it. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy around them. I believe uh, I'm one of my notes in the annotated use changes. I did make reference here, renting rooms. Uh, and this was related to renting rooms in your residential districts. I did make a note here that we may want to consider looking at a short term uh, rental regulation to handle things like Airbnb, because there is kind of a difference in the use to one thing for me to have a roommate renting a room from me and living in the house. Another thing for me to have a space in my house for rent that is turning over on a regular basis. So if that, by you posing the question, I'm assuming there's some level of interest or concern and therefore it may be something we should explore.
Linda, you're muted. Linda, you're muted. Sorry, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, I know it's relatively new. Um, and for some people, it works really great. For others, it turns into a nightmare. But I think it's something that we have to think about because this may be the way of the future. Uh, instead of a hotel staying at somebody's house, I, I don't know. But I think it's something that we have to consider. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. And to be honest with you, I, I there's there's two things that I think are kind of looking into the future that we can be sure of with this. Uh, one is the intensity of Airbnb style accommodations will likely increase with time. Uh, and number two is though on that kind of the hotels push it back that they're being armed. A lot of the <laughs> academic research I've seen has shown that it's a different traveler that's typically doing the Airbnb than your typical hotel person. Uh, so to what extent it will increase may be questionable, but I have seen recent reports that uh, related to COVID, just kind of the effects that pandemics having on uh, the way we behave is that there appears to be a fair portion of travelers who feel more comfortable staying in someone's house than a hotel now due to COVID. So we, we, it, it is worthy of trying to look at uh, what level of interest and concern we should have on this moving forward. And I'll explore some regulations and at some point put something before you, so. Great, Great. thank you. Commissioner Alimo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on the Airbnb, um, Don, you were talking about um, some regulations in some cities around the world or in, in the U.S. that took a section uh, with or, or from the hotel industry. So what I think would happen in the city of Miami, they put in place a regulation or are in process of putting some, a regulation in that had to do with these Airbnbs being in areas where there's very expensive real estate and um, a lot of the owners weren't doing the Airbnb thing and maybe one or two of the owners in the area were. And it started causing a big problem in some very expensive areas with, you know, like a bunch of car college kids doing an Airbnb in a $5 million house cul-de-sac. Right, right. So um, I don't know how we regulate that. So I think we have to be. worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, come on. We got some very beautiful homes in Enfield. So, yeah, um, and, I don't know how you get around something like that. Uh, uh, again, that, that to yeah. me, in Enfield, in our community, that's more of an issue than having um, a conflict with a hotel industry. Right, right. And I know, so I'm working on an affordable housing plan down in Stonington right now, which Stonington is the home of Mystic. So that's a community with a tourism industry. And there, the, the concern over the short-term rentals, the Airbnbs, is the competition they pose in the overall market to unit availability, which can ultimately create, you know, if it's more lucrative for you to rent your accessory apartment or rent some of the apartments, in your apartment building, the short-term renters, then you're taking housing units out of the market that may be more affordable. So there, my point being is I hear what you're saying. I've read studies on kind of that Miami experience and so forth and other places that there is a number of dynamics to this. It's not just the hotels. It is the, you know, all of a sudden the, the, the party atmosphere within the wealthy stable location and the competition of tourism with local residents trying to find housing, so. Yep, thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay. Good, anything else? No? No. Mr. Chairman, I have a comment. Sure, go ahead. Um, Don, on page 13, you were talking about wireless communication facilities, and I do believe that we're going to really need to um, have some major focus on 5G because they have a lot of uh, 
containers as they're calling them and a lot they use a lot of uh different posts and and lighting or light posts and things like that where uh, we will need to be regulating that yeah so there's there's, there's uh, a couple studies i think uh, it was uh one of the uh southern cogs in connecticut that uh, did a whole study on it yeah we can definitely look at that and we will look at that i figured i'd deal with that when we get to your wired wireless telecommunications yeah. uh one of the things and i'm just throwing this out there for just to uh, be aware of so one of the brokers in our office is really up on this technology because at the end of the day there's you know there's the potential for lease agreements and yep. commissions so of course a broker is going to jump all over it but one of the things that's actually interesting he had this technical guy do a, a web conference with us to talk about this technology and one of the things occurring right now is the technology is evolving so quickly uh, that the boxes, the mountings, the coverage areas and so forth is actually rapidly changing. So I need to get a grasp on kind of what the technology is right now in the siting and where the technology is heading uh, to try and make sure we can get a regulation that will not go obsolete instantly. And that's my biggest fear right now that it's gonna go obsolete instantly, but we'll deal with it, so. Cool. Uh, the other thing was the outdoor dining. And yep. uh, we have been in the past uh, very strict about that. I'm curious to hear from the commission as to how they feel about it now after COVID-19 provisions which pretty much just allows them everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think you guys have done a good job monitoring where and keeping um, safety first on all the outdoor dining. And until we get an answer on what's happening with COVID, I don't think any of us can really say, you know, exactly how to proceed with it. Well, I think that what I'm getting at is um, we've had, you know, they're basically pop-ups in, in, in the parking lots and to the sides of the buildings, which would never have been permitted before, but there doesn't seem to be a problem with them either. And people seem, I think after COVID, if we ever get after COVID, um, which I hope sooner than later, of course. Um, how do you how do you foresee that moving? Do you do you think that you might be more relaxed about allowing these things, or do you probably maybe a hybrid in between? Well, well, I, again, I think that you know what we have to do is we have to let it run its course in terms of you, you know right now you know there, there's not a lot of traffic or there's not a lot of use of these you know people still are resisting going to restaurants and eating you know in public so it, you know but as soon as you know you get a significant influx of you know people who might want to do that then i think that safety is our main concern we are not going to allow them in parking lots the way we do now because there's going to be people all over the place you know nowadays i i can drive into hartford every single morning and not hit any traffic you know and i've never been able to do that for the past you know 40 years and in in but as soon as this covid thing goes away and everybody's driving and there's there's a lot more you know people out and about i think that you know we're we're going to look at our regulations and we're safety is going to be our big concern in terms of it's not going to be anywhere you know it's going to be significantly more intense than we have right now so you know i think that we we just need to sort of you know not throw you know the, the baby out with the water you know just because of of covid but you know we, we need to sort of review it but i think that ultimately it's it, it it's going to be modified but it's not going to be you know carte blanche you can do whatever you want to do wherever you want to do it because you know the, gov the governor said you have to allow them to do it and, and i think that that's you know the direction I, I believe our, our commission is going to go. I, I, I agree with everything you just said, Rich. And I also think that 
I venture to say 50% of the restaurants, when business picks back up, they're going to need their parking lots. You know, a lot of these places used half their parking lot to set up these temporary tents. And mm -hmm. I, for one, I'm not going out right now and having a steak dinner underneath the tent and it's 20 degrees outside. So, you know, I think they're going to want their parking lots back. People are going to go back indoors when we all get on the same page of where this COVID is going. But for right now, I don't think any of us have a surefire ramp, but I do agree with you a lot of these places, it just doesn't work for them. Or all, great, all great ideas and thoughts. It, it, it it has, that, oh, go, go ahead, Linda, sorry. I, I agree that we'll have to revisit it after COVID because right now, the restaurants aren't at 100% capacity. So to say, okay, do outdoor dining and fill your restaurant, where are they gonna park? So I, I think we have to wait a little while and see how things work. So let me just on, add, if, if I could just temporary ask. permits, right? Yeah. I, I'm yeah, sorry, what right? Ken? They're all temporary permits. Yes. Yeah. They so are. I, I mean, when the day comes, then as they come in to either permanently get the permit, I think it's going to be a case by case basis. Like Rich said, safety's number one concern. And, yep. you know, and we'll just take it from there. It's not a bad idea, but I, I think it for a permanent use, it's going to have a lot more to it. So could I just ask a little bit of a probing question uh, on this? Because I try and gauge, as I said, your temperature, recognizing that, you know, restaurants will need their parking back and that you're, you know, it's a reasonable statement. You're not going to allow these things out in the parking lots. Uh, do you find, do you think you may be more favorable to outdoor dining overall? in adequately designed spaces like patios and so forth. We do now. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that in terms of, yes, you know, we, we, I would encourage it in terms of, you know, I like to eat outdoors on a, on a nice sunny, sunny after, you know, evening or, you know, summer evening when the, the wind's, you know, just, not, just right. It, it's the best place to eat. Yep. On a patio okay. or a deck, but not in a parking lot. Correct. Correct. <laughs> yeah. On a well-designed, yes. thought out. I agree. Established. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're all on the same page. Once okay. COVID goes away, Ken, uh, you're, you're, you're going to see, uh, um, and, and regulations come back into play with the fire department, the health department. You know, a lot of those places are not going to be able to comply with those regulations. Right. So. Yeah, you're just not going to see an abundance of it, uh, or or they're not going to want to expend the money to be able to comply with it. Uh, you know, because of the COVID, uh, the the rules are pretty much non-existent, or they're lax yeah. so much that you know we're just allowing it, and and so is it the health department and fire fire departments. But yeah, I'm I'm all for the outdoor dining as long as they can comply uh, with with you know the uh, uh, the rules and the regs. Right. I drove by, uh, we approved that uh, restaurant on the little mall there, um, Palumba or whatever. And, yeah, and he built a beautiful outdoor deck over there. So it looks like he's, you know, heading in the right direction for permanent outdoor that's, seating. That's wooden, wooden tap, that one? No, the yeah. one on uh, Cranbrook. Cr Cranbrook. Yeah, right behind Smith Gary Oh, oh, oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that is a permanent. Yeah, no, I know, but that's what I mean. That's something with an umbrella. You sit at the table like Rich was talking about and enjoy mm -hmm. your dinner. So, Lori, you were saying it's not allowed at all right now. Lori, did you say in our regulations we don't allow it? Oh, dining? no, 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 I did not say that. It's, well, that's that's what that, I thought you said. It's, it's a little bit stricter than I thought maybe you might, you know. So, what I think we should do is a conversation up. in the future. Right, I think we should definitely look at it and try to find a way to make it permanent. Make it safe, because I think, and from what I'm hearing, the restaurants all are going to want to have outdoor dining permanently, because they're afraid people aren't going to come back in. They're really thinking that this is going to last a long time in people's minds psychologically. And um, I think it's something we should really look at 
So find a way to let the restaurants have an opportunity to have outdoor dining um, all the time. You know, now obviously when it's really cold, but like Commissioner Nelson was saying, a nice deck, a nice patio. Um, find a way that to, to make it work because they're going to need it. Um, I, I think I think the restaurants are really hurt and they're waiting now. I know a couple of them are waiting for the governor's new order. They're uh, ready to start putting up tents again April 1. This order expires, I think, March 1st, I believe, or the end of February. And the I rest believe all the, I believe, I'm sorry, I believe all the orders have been extended to April 20th at this point. Have they? Okay, so they, they're looking to go beyond that because the restaurants are really, really hurting and they don't see, especially the elderly, coming back inside. The restaurants that had outside dining, did really well with it and it helped their business tremendously. And I think if we could find a way to put it in our regulations, a good, nice looking, safe outside dining for these restaurants, that would be great. I think we should it's, do it. It's in our regulations, Frank. But Lori is saying it's a little tough to do. It's a little very restrictive. You know, or with alcohol and stuff like that, it is. Right, so it, we have- it's gonna, it's gonna be a case by case basis. Yeah. Like Rich was saying, it all depends on the facility, the location, the space that they have, and safety. So you can't really do a blanket uh, regulation to cover them all because every place is different. So currently in our regulation, it's almost impossible, right, to have outdoor dining. No. No, we it's just, not impossible. We just, we well, just yeah. approved Cranbrook. We approved... Uh, um, What's that place? Uh, Panera, 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 we Panera did. Bread. Yeah. You know, they yeah. have, it's there. You just, no, it's I, safety. Yeah. But I think we kind of, did we pr approve Panera under the COVID? No. Did no, that was, that was part of their site plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Lori, what, what do you yeah. think that is in our regulation now that we could? Uh, well, I, I was, just, or, or I was make, just. Or make it more user friendly, I would say. That's what I. Yeah, that, that, that's it, all. That, yeah. More user friendly. Make it more user friendly, and but you know, I was just trying to get a quick, as Don says, the temperature as to what how you're feeling towards that, because it's it's completely different now than what we've ever allowed. That's for more, sure. more user friendly. That's a good way to put it. That's for me. More user friendly. Well, eating outside right now, my temperature is very cold. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. It's really good for ice cream. It doesn't melt. <laughs> all right we all good cool all right thanks don so. all right thank you guys look forward to seeing thank you again soon don could i just ask a quick question um sure. do you have a feel for when we could we should be starting our steering committee with the pocd sooner than later uh that, yeah. <laughs> that that's been my general feeling i'm i'm ready to go on that so okay all right so we can uh, talk uh at a later time yeah why don't you and i plan I on having know. a meeting meeting next week and work out some logistics so sounds good great thank you guys great thanks thank you. have a good, good night. night thanks okay um correspondence seeing none um, just to remind you, you got an email from Nicole Maruka um, regarding the Connecticut land use law um, biannual meeting that's usually held at Wesleyan. So if any of you want to join it, um, please sign, you know, tell Nicole that uh, you want to sign up for it. Um, it will be virtual and you have to bring the thing. I think it's March 16th. Saturday. I, I, don't know it's, I, I remember it's a Saturday. It's always a Saturday. Um, but even if you don't want to go, um, the book itself is $40. And if you want to go, you get to be virtual and get the book. So I would just sign up to be there anyway. And then if you want to pop in and out, you could if you decide to go. It's, it's a really great overview of all the different land use commissions and what their purview mm -hmm. is and their jurisdiction and yep. how you integrate between. So yep. it's it's a, an excellent uh, like little well, well, you can pop in and out of it? You can pop in and out of it? Yeah. yeah, just like you could this, yeah. Oh, okay. 
I thought so you, if you don't want to hear about historic districts and you want to hear about uh, inland wetlands, you can just pop in when you think they're 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 gonna be on. So good. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else, Lori? Uh, not not nope. Nope. Okay, Commissioner's correspondence. Seeing none. Director of Development Services report. We're getting the train station. Woo -hoo! Yay! <laughs> That's the Is it a news. platform, Lori, or a station? It's a platform, and With we will station. not have like the big uh, Taj Mahal like they had yeah. proposed. And it's going to stay on the east side, and it'll be a single track. And what about the, uh, will they have a waiting room? Because the paper alluded to that. No, that's, there'll, there'll be areas where there'll be like an overhead, you know, roof or something just for, you know, to protect you from the elements. But basically, you know, it's, it's just going to be kiosks and uh, directional signage. Okay. And a platform. And a platform. Yep. Which like will hold, Lux. I believe, six cars. Uh, What's drawing, that? No, I watched a meeting, a presentation, a drawing looks nice. There is a little sheltered area for people to be in. Yeah, it's, a it, remnant you know, the build, the, the building Where itself is really stuff. for utilities. Right. It looked like there was a, gr a glass shelter. Yeah, sort. yeah, it's just an overhead. Looked nice. Great. Yeah. Uh, Thank administ you. I'll set everyone. Mm -hmm. Administrative uh, approval report. Uh, nope, nothing has uh, come through the office for administrative approvals. Okay. Applications to be received? Uh, we do have one application in the office for a freestanding sign associated with the Chase Bank that's being constructed. So that'll be on the next uh, agenda. Okay. That can't be done administratively? No. It says site plan review in the regulations. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, opportunities and unresolved issues. Zone, planning and zoning and wetlands. Uh, you probably know more about it that. than I do. <laughs> nope. I know nothing now. So um, that's what I know. Yeah. Nothing's changed in the last two weeks. Okay. Unless anybody has any posts, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. I make a motion. We adjourn. Second. Second. Motion fain seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 Everybody Thank have a you. great night. Have a good you night. Too. Have a good, good night. Weekend. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night.